Good evening, everybody. Our uh, speaker tonight needs no introduction, almost literally. Um, uh, Andy Conley um, is uh, one of the ministers over at Creve Hall, grew up here, um, and unless you've come to us really lately, um, you know that his dad, Marlon, uh, was with this congregation since its inception for quite a number of years. And I don't know if you have um, watched uh, Andy online through the Creve Hall stuff or, or happened to have been over there, but he learned well from his father. And I've uh, known Andy, I guess, almost all my life. And... Um, I am quite impressed with uh, the man, the preacher he's turned out to be. Um, so we look forward to hearing what he has to say. Uh, first, let's pray together. Father, we come to you tonight in complete humility, acknowledging you as all-powerful, acknowledging you as creator, um, acknowledging you as our Redeemer. And tonight, as we meet together, and we have groups meeting in various places, we pray that the time that we spend will be beneficial to us, and that we can apply ourselves to becoming more of the people you would have us to be. And Father, tonight, there are um, people here um, who are joyous, and we rejoice with them. But there are also people that are struggling, and we pray, Father, for them a special measure of your comfort and strength and peace. Help us each day to look not to serve ourselves, but to serve other people, just as the example that Jesus gave us. And it's in his name that we pray, amen. Let's stand together and we'll sing two songs before Andy brings us our message. To God be the glory, great things he has done, so love he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life and atonement for sin And opened the light gate that all may go in Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son Amen. 
I am glad to be here. I am glad to be here more than anywhere I could be, I would imagine, at this moment. It's good to see you. I've seen so many long-term faces and friends. But I want to uh, stop for just a minute and tell you, this is my first time to be able to do this with Stephen Hayes. Now, I go back way, way back with, this, with the Hayes family. And that, my, my friend John Hayes back there, Stephen's great dad, uh, knew Miss Diane very, very well, was one of the speakers at, at her funeral many years ago. Uh, this family is dear to me. I appreciate them so much. It's great to see John out. He has had uh, some tough weather lately, physically, and it's good. To, I've, I've already visited with him. We'll do more. But uh, Stephen and I are going to get to do something tonight, although he's exited the room, so I don't know what that means. Uh, uh, we are going to get to do something tonight that uh, I will enjoy doing. Talk to Bruce about it. Bruce Zupa talked to Bruce about it. And uh, he said it just seemed to fit right in this room uh, tonight. So we are going to engage in what Dad used to call preach a little, sing a little. How many of you remember that? Or show of hands. Yeah, the rest of you just forgot. Anyway, uh, it's preach a little, sing a little. Uh, and uh, that's what Stephen and I are going to do uh, a little bit uh, tonight. So I hope that will be enjoyable, beneficial to you on more than, in more than one way. Keep things moving along. But also, uh, hopefully, the song that we sing will mean more the next times you sing it because it's going to remind you of maybe some points that we made from Scripture, I think that's vital to do. If we're going to say that singing is an equal part of our worship, uh, then it helps for us to do this every once in a while and tie it together with a message. So I'm glad that you are here. I understand that uh, Nancy Davis is watching this online. I want to say 
Hi, Nancy Davis. Hello to Nancy Davis. One of the sweetest ladies I've ever known in my life. I guess me looking right back there means I'm looking right at you, Nancy. I want you to know that. Of course, I'm partial to the name Nancy. But uh, Nancy Davis is one of the sweetest ladies I've ever known. And, and I was told that she was going to be watching. So, Nancy, I appreciate you tuning in. All right. Uh, I want to start tonight by asking you this question. Does the forgiveness of a debt automatically equate to having grown spiritual riches? Now, let me just go ahead and tell you the answer is no, but I want you to consider it anyway. The answer is no. Does the forgiveness of a debt, does a debt, a debt canceled automatically mean spiritual riches have been grown? Now, you may have the opportunity now to grow some spiritual riches. Let's look at it like a bank, like a debt owed to the bank. Whatever debt, you fill in the amount, you fill in the bank, you, fill, you, you present whatever picture you want to present to yourself right here, but you go down there and, and this has been weighing and weighing and weighing on you. And you can't do what you'd like to do, like, well, I'd like to help my grandkids out with their college, or, or I'd like to have this, I'd like to put that room on the back of the house we've been putting off for so long, and I'd like to, and I'd like to. We'd like to, but there's this big monster debt. And until we get that at least paid way down or paid off, we just can't do any of those things. And you go down there and you say, yeah, I'm, 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 here to, I'm here to do my monthly obligation here to whatever it was. I was nearby, so instead of mailing it in, I just, I just thought I'd come in. Hey, did you know that you're the 50th customer today? And this month only... The 50th person, if we get that many walk in on any day, they get their debts canceled. You know, you know, I know that would never happen, but it works for a sermon, right? They get their debt canceled. And you've got this large, looming payment coming every month that keeps you from doing what you... Okay, now, they, they get rid of that does not mean you have suddenly all the money that you need in your retirement account. Does not mean that all of a sudden your kid's college is paid for. That does not mean necessarily, but it gives you a chance, right? A debt cancellation gives me a chance to do something, but, but I still have to do something with that. I'm going to come back to this idea in just a few minutes, but do you understand that the Bible teaches that regardless of how long you've been in Christ, and I know specifically how long some of you have been in Christ, because when I was baptized at age 12 in the other room, Hugh Denny was leading singing. The invitation song was Just As I Am. The key verse for me was the next to last verse, I believe, because that's the one that says, Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise I believe. Now fast forward to the close of the service. Dad has already taken my confession. I have confessed Christ. He's gone up to the, to the baptistry with me and buried me in, in baptism for the remission of all of my past sins. Come out like usual. People waiting to see you. You're wet but happy. Parents are even happier. They're wet with tears and happier, right? And so you're greeting all these people. Here comes Hugh Denny. And he says, I, I, I got, I, before I forget, I got to tell you this. And while I got you both here, he grabs dad and he grabs me. He pulls us over to the side. He said, did you know that it was almost like you all like rehearsed that? What, what are you talking about? It, you rehearsed that. What? He said, I don't know if you're aware, but here you came around the co corner. He saw you come and walk towards you. And you all met, and your embrace was at the moment of, because thy promise I believe. And he said, I know when we're singing that song, it's, we're talking about believing in the promise of God. We're, we're singing to God. We're not singing to an earthly father, but we're singing to a heavenly father. He said, I know that. But it was like in timing as if you had said, I've chosen to believe what you taught me, Dad. Because the embrace was on the moment of that phrase. I'll tell you, we didn't practice it. He didn't even know I was coming, okay? So I, I can tell you, we didn't practice it. But that is pretty neat to me. And so, to this day, if they sing that invitation, that's not our invitation song, is it? Okay, good. 
Leave that verse out if you do. I'm dead serious. Leave that verse out if you change your mind. Because to, to this day, uh, if we sing that song at Creve Hall or anywhere else I've been or if I'm holding a meeting, if they sing that verse, I have to stop. I just stop. I'm... Y'all keep going. I'll get composed in a minute. And then we pick up and we keep going. So that's my start. But can I tell you that what I was taught and what I know Scripture teaches is this. It doesn't matter what kind of start you had. It certainly doesn't matter who your parents are or were. It doesn't matter how long you've been in a pew. you got to finish. You have to finish. Scripture knows nothing of once saved, always saved. I don't know where some of you are from. I know where most of you are from, from right here. Half of you, I can tell you when you showed up here. I still got you in an old church directory somewhere, black and white. But I don't know where everybody is. I don't have to. Or where everybody's from. I don't have to. I can say this. You got to finish. And so what we're going to talk about tonight are the things that God put in place to help us finish and the things that help us grow spiritual riches. Because debt cancellation by itself does not automatically equate to having grown spiritual riches. Now, what are those things? If I followed you home tonight and I said, hey, I just, I just can I look in your pantry? <laughs> okay. I had a friend whose dad, I had a friend named Jim whose dad was named James. And Mr. James, every time me and a couple of other guys would come over, which was often, guys I grew up with going to, going to church, or going to school with rather, if we walked in, he'd hear our voice and he'd yell out from the, other end of the house to Mary Ann, his wife, Mary Ann. She'd say, what? He'd say, hide the food. <laughs> Reputation precedes you, right? So he knew. Let me just look in your pantry. All right, if I go to Nelson's pantry, I, I don't know what I find, but, but it's not necessarily the same thing that I'd find in Wyatt's pantry or in Stephen's pantry. We might all have some of the same things, right? But Stephen may go over to Nelson's house and go, oh, my God, you eat that? You know, that kind of thing. Everybody's got different taste. Here's what I know Scripture teaches. Everybody has different says. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and a host of other passages, but I love those two in particular, that talk about God orienting the body just as He desired. If a man's gift is, is this, let him this. If it's this, let him this. If it's this, let him this. You know that it, from the middle section of Romans chapter 12. When you get over to 1 Corinthians 12, you got essentially the same thing, just worded a little bit differently. A lot of differences in the body. But God ordered it that way. It's exactly what we need, by the way. But all of you have this, these things, in your spiritual pantry. Every one of you. Every one of you has at your disposal. You ever wonder, man, I don't know how brother so-and-so, if I could just bottle some of what he's got. Can I tell you that brother so-and-so, who maybe rightfully so is held in tremendously high esteem, there's, I see Miss Norma Reagan. I don't know how anybody could have done anything but held Mr. Buddy up in high esteem. If you agree with me, do your heads like this. Let's say that about Mr. So-and-so. He got there pulling out the same things from his spiritual pantry that God put there that are in yours. Because sometimes I think we say, well, I, you know, I just don't have. I, he had something that I don't have. That, will he be different in personality? Will he maybe have some slightly different traits or even slightly different talents? Absolutely. But there's, God didn't put something in Brother So-and-So's pantry that allowed him to finish and allowed him to not just have his debt canceled but grow spiritual riches. God didn't, God didn't put something in his pantry that... Well, he just didn't care as much about if you finished or if you could grow spiritual riches. It's there sometimes. You know, you ever, you ever open your pantry and do this? 
Or do you grab the first thing off the... Every once in a while, we have a tendency, the last thing we put on our shelf is in the front, right? You ever done this where you kind of, well, I thought we had another can or another box or another, and you're doing this, and finally, you ever done this? Way in the back. I completely forgot we had this. You ever done that? Yeah. That doesn't need to happen spiritually. I completely forgot that I had that. What are those things that, that everybody in here has at his or her disposal so that you can be like brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, grow spiritual riches that people want to emulate and finish strong? Because you got to finish. Well, in just a second, Stephen's going to lead us in a song that talks about one of these things. The first thing is passages. Now, what I've chosen to do, and some of you will, will really appreciate this maybe more than others, just because your mind will hearken back to another guy that stood up here and did things this way. I'm going to give you three words, and all of them are going to start with the same letter so that you can take them home and remember them. Passages. Right there. Passages. God's Word. Scripture. Every one of you has this at your disposal. Every one of you. Not just brother so-and-so. Every one of you has this at your disposal. It doesn't mean everybody takes of it, but every one of you has this at your disposal. And if you don't have one of these at your disposal, you're going to take mine home tonight. I'll give it to you. And then we can go out to the car and I'll give you six more. Because I want you to have it. Hey, there are already little outlines drawn in here and stuff. I'll give you mine. Every one of you has passages. Psalm chapter 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. That's how Psalm 19 starts. Great psalm. First six verses. A man's got to look around. As he looks around, has got to be a fool, Scripture says, to walk out and go, accident. It's an accident. Really. You ever heard the phrase, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night? That's about what that would be. Listen, you got to work a lot harder to believe in what we're being told now than what Scripture tells you about the beginning of the world. That, that's a much longer reach. That's a much more difficult stretch to buy into, as we sometimes say, evolution. That's a much longer reach than faith. You want to talk science? Let's talk science. Science proves the Word of God. There's a lot of science in the Word of God. Some people don't want you to hear it. Did you know that if the sun were on the scale of things, we might just do this. On the scale of things, if the sun were that much closer to the earth, it would fry? Do, do you know that if the sun was basically the same amount, uh, further, from, further from the earth, that it would freeze? And yet somehow I'm supposed, scientists call this critical variables kept within critical limits. And I'm supposed to believe that those critical variables kept within those critical limits so that things just go and go and go and are and are and are as they have been. I'm supposed to believe that's accidental. It just hangs there. It doesn't get close enough. It doesn't get far away enough. The heavens declare the glory of God. But when you get to verse 7 of Psalm 19, he shifts and he stops talking about what we can learn about our God from nature and he starts talking about what we can learn from, from, from God from Scripture. And so he says, your word, your law, your precepts are wonderful. There is no substitute for this. If you want to finish, finish strong and be one of those brother or sister so-and-sos, every one of you, every one of you. It's an excuse, folks. I'm just telling you, it's a lazy excuse for people to say, well, God just didn't give me. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that God said, as you've read, He is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance? Are you telling me God says, I want you to finish and I deserve for you to finish strong, but I'm not going to give you what you need to do that? Is that the God 
that you're here to worship? Absolutely not. And so he did give it. And he started the opportunity to grow spiritual riches after a debt canceled. He started with passages. There is no substitute. How beat up is your Bible? Uh, this, this is one of my better ones now. Uh, they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. It, I don't know. It did. It fell further in plenty of ways, but it did not fall real far in this way. Uh, I now have no side on this Bible. The one I taught class with this morning has duct tape all, all over it. How beat up is your Bible? Now, if, if your current Bible is not beat up because it's new, you, but you, you understand what I'm saying? Are you in it enough for that to happen? Passages help me finish strong. So we're going to sing about that. Holy words are preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us go. Passages. The second thing that all of us have the opportunity to immerse ourselves in with people. And I'm not just meaning people in general. I'm talking about a specific people. <laughs> it's a group that Scripture refers to, depending on your translation, as a peculiar people. Sorry, but that's you. <laughs> that, that's, how the rechur- that's how the church is described that word peculiar then did not mean what it may mean to us now to a lot of people. It's a people for God's own possession. Really, if you look at the Greek, what you've got right here is an engulfing. The ideas of an engulfing. You are a people totally engulfed in God. That's 1 Peter 2.9. Passages and a people. A people. Did, did you know that you have a people? You say, well, yeah. I, I, you know, by the way, Mom, I've got that family tree chart that I was supposed to pick up. She knows what I'm talking about. I haven't told her yet, so I thought that made me think of it. You got a family tree? Do, do you have a chart? 
Do you know kind of where everything, do you look at that? Some people really immerse themselves in that, and that's marvelous. Others, well, just, no, I mean, you know, I, I can tell you all about my parents and all about my grandparents, a little bit about my great-grandparents, and that's about it. I'm impressed with people. That's me, by the way. I'm impressed with people that can go way, way, way back. Maybe some of you do that and you enjoy that, genealogy stuff. I say, so, do you know that you have a people and you think, well, yeah, I, I, what do you want to know? I can tell you about my people. And I know those are your people, and I know that that's people that God put in place for you as well. God designed the family. So we're not knocking the family. But I'm asking, if I say, do you know you have a people, did your mind go to the bloodline or did your mind go to the body? Did it go to the bloodline or the body? Because the thing that'll keep you and the thing that'll grow you, hopefully your people, bloodline, can do that. But you know, a lot of folks have a people, bloodline, that aren't helping in that way at all. Every family's got that possibility somewhere. But did you know you had a people, a body, passages? You want to grow spiritual riches because a debt cancellation of sin does not equate to automatically having grown spiritual riches. You're going to need passages. And to grow spiritual riches, you would do well to camp out in those and then to camp out with the people that God put in place for you. The body. Imperfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Imperfect, but imperfectly great because of its author and who they want to be. So, years ago, I did the funeral of a 95-year-old man right after that of his 96-year-old wife. And I told this story at his funeral. He didn't live far from here, just out 100 a little bit, knew a lot of people in the Bellevue congregation. I remembered the story, and I told it again at his funeral. I remember the story he had told me years earlier. His best buddy growing up, childhood and through school days, one-room schoolhouse over there at South Harpeth. You know, right just adjacent, right behind in where Ronnie Harris used to live. They went there as kids. Now, if this man were living, he'd be uh, 101. But they went there as kids. He never could get his best buddy in the church. He said, talk to him, talk to him, leave it alone, talk to him, leave it alone, talk to him, leave it alone. Spread out over many, many years. You'd see, luckily, he stayed in the community. He could do this with him periodically. But he said he always said the same thing. And then he just got a little more emphatic the older he got with it. I'm not coming down there. I'm not coming down there to that South Harpeth church. I'm not coming down there. Why? He said, once in a while I would say why. Sometimes I wouldn't. But, but this last time that we talked about it ever, I said, Why? And he said, too many hypocrites down there. And you know what my friend said? When they had this conversation, he was in his early 80s. He said, well, come on, one more won't matter. That's true. I don't mean it's a true story. It is a true story. But I mean it's true. Look, sin is by its very nature hypocritical. I walked an aisle in there. Some have walked an aisle in here, given their hand to some minister or elder. They've gone back there. They've, they've confessed the name of Jesus. They've gone up there. And after some short amount of time out there, they're not living like the confession in here. That's hypocritical. That's all sin is, is by very nature for the Christian. Sin is hypocritical to my claim. Not that we claim perfection. But I did say, I want to live for him who died for me. And if by Thursday, that's not what it looks like or sounds like, that's hypocritical. Sin by its very nature is hypocritical. So come on, one more won't matter. Yeah, they're imperfect. Absolutely. The body, the people, they're imperfect. Do I really think I'm going to walk and stand before my Lord? I'm going to stand before my Lord and I'm going to say, well, Lord, about that. As you know, John Smith was hypocritical. And he's going to say, 
You're right. You're right, Andy. John Smith was hypocritical. You go ahead. You don't believe that. So don't use that ever. Don't use that. You don't even believe it. Don't make it convenient. Passages, people. We, figuratively speaking, as the people of God, figuratively speaking, we sometimes, figuratively, pause in the wrong place in our life. If I said the name Willard Collins, I do say the name Willard Collins in this room. Most people would know who I was talking about. Oh, man, Brother Collins used to get up and make announcements at Lipscomb. And he would pause in the wrong place. One of his most famous pauses. I, I'm not sure it wasn't on purpose. But anyway. One of his famous pauses regularly was, We're here to worship God and Buddy Arnold. We'll lead us in our singing. Now, what? what? I'm not here to worship Buddy Arnold, right? That's, that's a literal pause in the wrong place. We figuratively pause in our lives in the wrong places. Something captures my attention that the Lord said, no, over here. I was driving down Granny White Pike in Nashville years ago, and I passed right in front of the Granny White Church building, now the Green Hills Congregation. I passed in front during the summer series they were having, and they would have, like a lot of folks do, out on the front sign, the topic and the speaker for the evening. And they were having a series on the Ten Commandments. And they were ready for thou shalt not kill. And on this day, the speaker this, that particular night was to be Bill Collins, who was a professor in the Bible department at Lipscomb. Some of you will remember Tommy Collins, his wife. Bill Collins was the speaker, and the sign guy, I found out the sign guy was out of town. Bellevue, you have a sign guy who's in charge of what goes. Now it's electronic, I know, but you got a sign person, right? Well, this was a physical sign, not electronic, and you got to figure out where to put the letters back then and all that kind of stuff. They had plenty of space on the sign, but he didn't use the space right. I drove by, I looked, and it said, Wednesday, thou shalt not kill Bill Collins. All on one line. And they had all this space underneath it. And they just didn't use the space properly. Wednesday, thou shalt not kill Bill Collins. So I had to do it. I picked up the phone. I called my friend Dale, who was the preacher there at that time. Talked for just a second. I said, well, hey, listen, I just passed your building. I got a question. Would it be okay to kill Bill Collins on a Thursday? He said, what are you talking about? I said, go look at your sign. Five minutes later, he called me back. He said, oh, my goodness, thank you. Our sign guy is out of town, and that was a sub. Well, that's us. Sometimes it's not funny, though. Sometimes our mistakes are not funny, and they break the heart of God. Sometimes they're not minor. Sometimes the domino effect from those things goes on and on and on. By the way, even after forgiveness has been extended, consequences can continue. That's us. Imperfect, but imperfectly great. These need to be your go-to people. Imperfectly great. And God planned. Planned for you. Passages and people. We're going to sing about the people that God put in place for you. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal. Uh-huh.
The third word is prayer. Passages, people, and prayer. This is in your pantry. Everybody's got this. God did not grant brother so-and-so an ability he did not give you to grow spiritual riches. It's there. It may go stale. It may get pushed to the back. You may, in a spiritual consideration, by illustration, forget it's back there. But you've got it. And this is how you finish. Passages, people, and prayer. Years ago, <coughs> Dad gave me a magazine, National Geographic magazine. Many of you know he was just a voracious reader. And he would subscribe to all kinds of things. Journal of the American Medical Association was always stacked up on his dining room table. And other things, you're like, why is he reading that, you know? But he wanted to pull illustrations to, to, to make things more clear. So he gave me this thing, and he said, hey, I'm through with this, I'm through with this. He gave me several of them. One of them was a, a National Geographic. And there was an article in there about a guy who got a hang glider, and he started up on the Upper East Coast of the, of the U.S., and he glided all the way down to Florida. Wow. And crazy, okay? But anyway, that's my thinking. When I, when I read this, I thought, no, no. How, how does that happen? Now, I was probably explained this in seventh grade science, but I wasn't paying attention or I've forgotten but throughout our atmosphere, there are warm air columns. And they call them thermals. And when somebody wants to do something like this, they just have to know, if you start up high enough, at a high enough elevation, you won't drop far enough. It's a lot further down than it is to the right or to the left where you'll find the next thermal. As long as you're in a thermal, you'll be good. And he would just start to drop and start to drop. And once you drop a certain amount, then you're going to have to and find the next thermal, and it would pick him up and carry him on. And after a while, he's going to drop a little more, and he's going to have to find the next thermal, and it's going to carry him on. For Jesus himself, prayer was how he was going to finish. Prayer was his thermal. Read John 17. The whole chapter is prayer. Beautiful prayer. Passionate prayer. Prayer is sweat drops of blood. You remember that one. That's not the John 17. But you remember that? If the sinless Son of God thought that was beneficial to finish. Maybe you and I could give it a go. You ask somebody, do you pray? Yeah, I pray. I prayed at lunch today. We always pray over our meal. I, I, I pray before I go to bed at night or I pray when I get up in the morning. Wonderful. Wonderful. Can I tell you, if you study prayer in the New Testament, it's got to be a lot better than that. It's got to be deeper than that. It's got to be better than that. There was an old man back in that other room. I was really small. Troy Braswell. Raise your hand if you know that name. Okay. I didn't even know his name then, but I named him. He was the prayer man. That's what I called him. I didn't know his name. I just called him the prayer man. But I already knew something about his likely prayer lives, for life from the way he prayed here, there. In all honesty, on a scale of 1 to 10, you just rate yourself 
honestly before the God who already knows. Are you strong? Passages, people, and the thermal that God designed to allow me to rise and ultimately to allow me to land because we've got to finish. We're going to sing about how we pray. Hear me when I call Proof that I'm getting older, he had to tell me three times. I had to step closer, <laughs> closer. Eh? In just a minute, we're going to sing More Holiness Gives Me as an invitation song. Might not seem one, but we're going to make it one tonight because of where I want to head with those, what we call invitation thoughts. We started out with the idea that a debt canceled does not automatically mean I've grown spiritual riches. But it does give me that option, that opportunity. It gives me that opportunity. And God has put some things in place, and we could have listed a few more. God has put some things in place for every Christian. If he or she will take of that, while it's true somebody may have something you don't seem to have or don't think you have in your spiritual pantry that's more based on a personality, a trait, or a talent. God has put all I need in my pantry to finish and to finish strong. 
And I have to finish. I've seen some that did not reach anywhere near the age of most people in this room. Between my and their ages 14 and 34. Between my and their ages 14 and 34. I had seven personal friends die. I'm not talking about people that just happened to go to the same school. Darken the door of the Bellevue congregation here and there. I'm talking about friends. I'm talking about we would have been in each other's weddings. Seven. Between my and their ages 14 and 34. Two of them died on the way to my house in separate motorcycle accidents in different years. Both of those... I was the last person to talk to him. 30 minutes earlier and 20 minutes earlier. Most of you, if not all of you, have far passed where they were. You still have to finish. You can do that with passages. You can do that with the people And you can do that bathing in prayer. I want you to finish. I care too much about you not to see you finish. Many of you had a tremendous impact on my getting to this point. I've got to finish. I want to see you finish. So I can give you more than a handshake at the back on down the line when we see each other. You got to finish. Holiness helps you get there. If I was to say, raise your hand if you've got all the holiness you need, surely nobody would raise their hand. I hope not. Because the person in the most dangerous position is the person that thinks they have arrived. That's who I'm worried about. Holiness will help me finish. And that's offered. You ever think about holiness as an offer God makes? Because it's His holiness you got to come get. It's His holiness you got to share in, not yours. Matthew 5 verse 3 is the first thing ever said in one of the greatest sermons ever ever seen in Scripture. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is a sermon on the mount. It looks like a lot of mini sermons, and it kind of is, but it's one sermon. That's why we call it the sermon, not sermons on the mount. The sermon, singular, on the mount. What's it about? It's about righteousness. It's just a sermon on righteousness that says, here's how God goes about making man righteous who can't stand righteous before him anyway based on his own goodness. Now, if you were going to preach a sermon on righteousness, how God can have you stand righteous when you know you're not good enough, what would you say? The very first thing he said was, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That has nothing to do with being sad. Oh, blessed are those who are hurting. Now, Scripture speaks of that, but that's not Matthew 5, 3. That's way out of context. I don't believe the Beatitudes are arbitrarily arranged. There's an order. We don't have time to talk about that. But if I don't think I'm spiritually impoverished, based on my own goodness. I'll never submit to the righteousness or the holiness of God because I don't think I have to. And that's why the very first thing said in a sermon on righteousness is, blessed are those who recognize their spiritual poverty. That's Matthew 5, 3. The next beatitude, blessed are they that mourn. They recognize that. They begin to mourn over it. Thankfully, it picks up from there. Holiness is a pursuit that only God's passages, people, 
and prayer can give. And we want you to finish and finish strong. So as we sing that, which generally is a prayer song, it's my prayer for you that you'll finish and finish strong. Let's stand and sing. <clears throat> more holiness give me more striving to share in communion tonight uh, or today. There's a uh, Tony set up an area here in the cry room in the back. And you can make your way out toward that direction while we sing our closing song. I want to thank Andy again for sharing with us this evening. And so I know you want to spend time with him as we dismiss as well. So we'll sing this and then we'll have our closing prayer. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without thee. together and pray. Holy Father in heaven, we come before you in humility and in reverence to you. You are our creator. All things are created by you. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you give us. We probably receive more than we deserve. We thank you for our ability to be, to be here tonight. We thank you for bringing Brother Conley, or Andy as we know him for many years, bringing your passages and your word to us. We thank you for his family and the influences upon him, whom we know very well. We ask you to be with him and his family, and particularly Miss Nancy, his mother. 
We know that she is close to you and that you are close to her. Let her always look to you and give her comfort. Father, we fall short many times in doing the things that we should do that come from your passages and the word that we hear frequently. We ask your forgiveness of those things. We ask strength. Bring us closer to you. Let us give us more. Give us more of thee to thee. Father, we come to the end of a week that honors the many men and women in uniform that serve our country. Our special prayers go to those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice, to them and their families who continue to grieve throughout the many years. We pray also for those that have suffered injuries over these past many years that live with those injuries and inability today. Give them comfort, give them strength. Let them look to you. Let them pray to you. Father, we ask your blessings upon the leadership of our congregation here and throughout the world. Give them the strength that they always need to look to thee and to set, go guide us in prayer. Be with us until we meet again. Keep us and forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.